afternoon and welcome to this Logger Lecture online. My name is Jessica Lounsbury and I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement here at McMaster. Over the next two years, our Logger Lecture series of webinars will feature talks on some of the research taking place at McMaster University that is helping reach the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their targets. The Sustainable Development Goals are a call to action to end poverty and hunger protect the planet and ensure healthy lives, peace and prosperity by the year 2030. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Claudia Emerson, founding director of the Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation at McMaster, associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and associate member in the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Health Sciences. Her work in applied ethics considers ethics issues and policy gaps in global health research and she has been working with stakeholders in the field for over 15 years, examining issues that arise along the discovery to delivery pathway for health technologies and interventions. She's especially interested in ethics issues related to the introduction and adoption of novel technologies, the management of infectious disease, and data sharing and models of data governance. She is currently the principal investigator of research programs funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Canadian Institute of health research that consider these issues. If you would like to ask Dr. Emerson a question, please type it in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will have some time to answer a few questions at the end of the formal presentation. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming, in welcoming Dr. Emerson as she reflects on the role of ethical, social, and cultural thinking in, in supporting the sustainable development goals. Dr. Emerson? Thanks very much, Jessica, and thank you for that uh, introduction and for the invitation to participate in uh, today's webinar. So thanks very much. I'm delighted uh, to be here um, uh, this, this afternoon. Um, as a MAC grad, uh, I'm, I always relish uh, the opportunities to engage with a fellow alum and with uh, members of the McMaster community. So it's, it's really terrific uh, to be here. And uh, it's especially gratifying to be able to talk a little bit about the Institute mm -hmm. and our work, uh, particularly in relation to these larger global initi initiatives such as the SDGs, and to highlight uh, really the important uh, and critical role that ethics and ethical reflection plays in, in supporting some of these endeavors and in supporting science and technology innovation for the public good. So it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a, a tremendous opportunity. Okay, so for uh, today's presentation, um, I'm really split into uh, two major parts here and then the third part with the q and I hope we can engage a conversation at the end. But sort of in part one, I'm going to cover a little bit about the Institute, who we are, what we do. And part of what we do is ethical, social and cultural thinking, which is our distinctive approach to um, the uh, ethics issues and policy issues that we deal with in global health and development. And I'll say a little bit about that and its history and how we've come to develop it. And in the second part, I'll really like to get into a discussion of the SDGs and how our work at IAPI and in particular our ESC thinking uh, supports that work. So thinking about who we are. So the, the Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation, IEPI, we're a multidisciplinary team of scholars and we address uh, ethical issues, uh, ethics related risk and policy gaps encountered along the innovation pathway for health technologies and interventions. And we're a multidisciplinary group of, of scholars. Now we do sit in the Faculty of Humanities in the Department of Philosophy, but we are by no means all philosophers, uh, we have expertise on the team in social science, in biomedical science and engineering, public policy, um, health technology, um, and law. And this is uh, very important because the, the kinds of issues that we deal with are so complex, so multifaceted, that they really do need this uh, multidisciplinary lens in examining um, uh, the issues. And so here, here's the team. Uh, we are uh, 14 people and strong and um, a group of early career scholars as well as senior scholars and we're growing. So we're in this um, fast uh, sort of rapid expansion currently uh, since arriving at McMaster in 2015, uh, simply because there is uh, obviously so much uh, need and demand for ethical reflection across uh, some of these uh, programs. So what do we do? 
Well, we do applied ethics and policy research. Um, we deliver uh, the ethics consultation service and research program that supports the entire global health division of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that's something that we've been doing uh, for the last 15 years. And in that work, we don't just support um, the foundation, but we support all of its partners in grantees and, um, and many of the stakeholders in the global health space. We apply ESC thinking, and I'll say a little bit more about that, along the entire innovation pathway from idea to impact. And by that, I mean that uh, we really get integrated right at the very start of, of an idea. So if you think about uh, the kinds of issues that research involve in the global health and development space, you have the things that are being developed in the lab. And as they move up that innovation pathway into dis from discovery into development, so into human clinical trials, um, and then into adoption and uh, you know, regulatory uh, governance and oversight, along that entire pathway, we try to integrate as much as possible ESC thinking to consider uh, the issues, uh, so address the barriers and consider the enablers um, for good uh, research outcomes. We work collaboratively with stakeholders to deliver practical and actionable solutions. And I would say that this is also another distinctive feature of the things that we do um, at IEPI. Um, obviously our multidisciplinary approach brings uh, different disciplines to bear on the problems and the challenges that we encounter, but it's also really critical to engage with different partners and stakeholders in that process, both uh, at the community level, at the regulatory level, at the international level, we work across the spectrum of academia, industry, um, and, and research um, to, to deliver uh, practical and actionable solutions. And this is again, key for us um, as an academic research enterprise, obviously um, theoretical concepts, conceptual analysis is important, but our stakeholders, uh, the end users of the work that we do are policymakers and decision makers. And to that extent, it's very important that the things that we work on actually translate into actionable recommendations or policy guidance, which someone can take and implement in the field. <clears throat> and then the last bit, of course, um, of what we do, and, and very important, obviously, as an institute on campus, is we educate and train, and we're committed to training the next generation of scholars to respond to the challenges of globalization and health inequity, which, as we've seen recently in the pandemic, is great. So... Now we do all of this work in the context of four uh, main research pillars. Um, the first being data ethics and governance. And this is usually concerned with issues around the quality and uh, of, of data collection, ethical use of data, data sharing, which is a persistent challenge and pervasive challenge in, in research. Um, and this is very often the case, particularly in endeavors that involve uh, high income countries partnering with low income countries in the research enterprise. And so we deal with a lot of uh, data sharing challenges there. Our next pillar has to do with the ethics of translational science. So primarily clinical trials involving human participants, uh, both starting at sort of phase zero um, um, all the way up to phase three, and then in pharmacovigilance at the level of phase four. Um, some of the issues that we encounter here have to do with um, design, um, inclusiveness, uh, ensuring that vulnerable populations are um, um, adequately treated and selected and can participate um, in the research process. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later in the presentation. And then we have the ethics of infectious disease management, which has uh, kept us quite active uh, recently during the pandemic. And then our last pillar has to do with ethical issues related to innovation and emerging technologies, um, which is very exciting work. And this pillar involves things uh, like the uh, genetically modified mosquitoes carrying the gene drive for malaria elimination, AI, and some of those uh, big data technologies. 
And our uh, work and our pillars actually fit very nicely with our core objectives at the Institute. And I'll just say that um, as with most research institutes and centers here at McMaster, uh, we um, are focused obviously on, on research, education, advising. Uh, but for us, that last pillar there, influence is, is very important because of the space that we work in. And by that, I mean that we really want to be able to move the needle forward in global health and development. So this is the sense in which our actionable practical solutions are the way in which we work, um, the methodology that we approach. We want to ensure that our, our policy solutions are adapted, um, that they're taken into account and that this ethical reflection actually comes through um, across the uh, innovation pathway into policy. And so that's the sense in which influence is an important uh, pillar for us and a little bit distinct from the others. So before I get into our ESC thinking, what ESC thinking is and how we, we came to it, I thought it would be important to say why. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve um, at IEPI? And I think this quote by Bill Gates uh, in the Wall Street Journal uh, back in 2010, I think captures it quite nicely. And Bill said that science can simplify the job, but the human piece is the ultimate test. And I think here, um, you know, the critical idea behind this is no matter how elegant uh, the solution or how practical and useful and effective uh, the technology or intervention is, there's really no guarantee that it's going to make it into the hands of those that need it if all of the other uh, uh, issues, the normative issues, are not accounted for. And so here we're talking about not just the ethics issues, but the regulatory issues, Public, public acceptance. And uh, so there's a multiplicity of things that need to happen um, in order for a good technology or intervention to, to actually uh, make it uh, uh, into the hands of those that need it and to have the kind of impact that's needed. So solving, for example, for the sustainable development goals with all of the many targets and the different complexities, it's really going to require not just human capital and tools, but it's really going to require mobilization of this human piece. And what do I mean by the human piece? Well, the human piece, and we've seen quite a bit of it now uh, during uh, the pandemic um, with the distrust of science and technology. Uh, and this is particularly um, prevalent in um, some groups, marginalized uh, groups that historically have uh, suffered abuses at the hands of science and technology have not been treated well. Um, there is the fear of loss, real or perceived, and uh, this is uh, the kind of loss, for example, of things not of the status quo. So even though we may have things that work, um, and maybe they don't even work all that well, there sometimes is a fear of moving on to something new, right? So the status quo becomes sort of a comfort zone. And this is the argument by a colleague, Calestis Chuma, who was a, a wonderful scientist at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, Calestis passed away several years ago, but he was the uh, leader behind uh, Freedom to Innovate, this remarkable report that sort of laid out how technology and innovation was going to be critical, critical to the development and sustainable development on the African continent. And so he talks a lot in his book about um, the fear of loss, real or perceived, in relation to changes, particularly to embrace the, the new that may come along. There is, of course, uh, the involvement of actors that hold diverse and sometimes conflicting values of interest. And of course, when you're working in the global public health space and in sustainable development, this is going to be the case. So even though we may come to the table with a shared goal um, and have an idea in mind, say the eradication of disease, the elimination of poverty or gender equality, actors come to the table with uh, diverse ideas. Um, and, uh, and thoughts about how that might happen. And oftentimes this can lead to conflict, even when you're all working towards the same goal. There is, uh, of course, the challenge, particularly in low resource settings around the policy environment, which very often is unprepared to support the development, testing and introduction of novel health technologies and interventions. And, and this can become um, a, a tremendous barrier to things that have a, a positive impact on um, global public goods. And as we've seen now during the pandemic, there is a misunderstanding and more communication of science, which very often then has people be, becoming very reluctant 
um, about uh, a technology or intervention. And then there is, of course, the danger of overpromising and underdelivering. And we saw this quite a bit uh, in years past with relation to stem cell technology, um, gene editing, um, you know, particularly uh, with regards to accessibility and affordability. So there may be wonderful technologies that we can develop, but if they're not available in the clinic or to the communities that need them, then the promise of science tends to evaporate and then we're right back where we started with that first bullet of the distrust of science and technology. So thinking about those complexities with um, the human piece, then how, how do we address that? And so our approach at the Institute has been to adopt um, ESC thinking, so ethical, social, and cultural thinking. And ESC thinking is as much an attitude as it is an approach. And I say an attitude because part of the skills that we develop and that we have to apply in using ESC thinking to consider some of the challenges in the space are things like listening, um, empathy, and really thinking about uh, the different stakeholders, really putting yourself in the shoes of, of, the, of the stakeholders and the partners that you work with. So that piece around solidarity that um, we've heard a lot uh, about uh, during this pandemic. And then the approach, of course, is the scholarly piece. So, you know, we're, we're uh, an applied ethics group. So we have specific methodology. We still have to apply the norms. But combining, starting from that, that point of view of, of empathy and listening and really trying to understand is just as critical as the methodological uh, sort of norms of ethics that we might apply to a problem. And ESC thinking emerged from the ESC, the Ethical Social Cultural Program for the Grand Challenges in Global Health, which was the, the, that uh, large scale global initiative that the Gates Foundation launched uh, in 2005. It ran from 2005 from 2010. And during the course of that program, there were 44 major uh, programs that were funded to solve intractable problems of global health. And so there were really interesting things in there like vector control, uh, genetically modified um, foods to address uh, drought, um, so drought resistant crops, needle free vaccines. So it was really this kind of giant out of the box thinking approach to the problems of, of global health and sustainable development. But the 44th project was not uh, an innovative science project. It was actually an innovative humanities and social science project, which was ours, which was really about then what are the ethics issues that we're gonna have to consider to ensure that these uh, projects and programs are ethically developed, that they're inclusive, that they're just, and that they promote the kinds of things that at the time we wanted in the millennial development goals and now in the sustainable development goals. And so since then, um, the group um, has supported over 180 projects and programs uh, in over 15 years uh, in working in this space. And this includes industry, government, academia, NGOs. So we work with uh, the World Health Organization, other funders, um, with um, the pharmaceutical industry as when they're grantees and partners um, and, uh, and, and really try to understand what those issues are. And so our methodology has been developed over the course of that time. And we are still to this day, still trying to refine, uh, learn from it and to really codify it um, in, in, uh, in, in, in trying to teach and, and continuously get better in applying it. And so what does ESC thinking involve? Well, it involves applying an ethics lens uh, to the issues, considering the social and cultural context. And so this is key. And so while normative analysis, you might take a particular frame, say utilitarian lens or a deontological lens and apply it to any particular problem, we want to do that, but we want to be particularly sensitive to socio and cultural norms. So I'll give you an example. An example of this might be um, a, a policy document might say that a, a young girl of 16, say in Nigeria, is eligible to consent for herself to be involved in a research program. But the sociocultural context means that if she's living at home with mom and dad, that they actually need to provide consent as well and to be involved, even though legally and from a research context, it's not required. Sensitivity to the context in which um, the person might find themselves in is important. And so you would design a study wherein part of that consent process involves parents in the information and in the process in order to be responsive to that ESC concern. 
So another element of uh, ESC thinking is that we are committed not just to understanding what the barriers are, but also enablers. And by this, I mean that oftentimes scientists uh, think of ethics as, as kind of a checkbox exercise, right? So you, you understand what are the issues you need to be concerned with, you check them along, you get ethics review um, in your protocol. And so it's always looking as if something you need to overcome. But IEPI, we really think of ethics as an enabler as well. What are the sorts of things that we can consider and that we can think about that actually enable the success of a project that uh, enrich, say, the um, experience of stakeholders, that enhance the quality of research? And so thinking about what those enablers are is just as critical as to overcoming the barriers. And so in that sense, we take the roles and responsibility of the various actors very seriously, and we rely on action guiding principles to delineate obligations. And this is because, as I mentioned earlier, stakeholders come to the table uh, with various values, interests, different norms. And so principles can often be that common language at which people can sort of unite and move forward. And lastly, we partner with experts globally to ensure that local perspectives are reflected in our thinking. And so our characteristic features of our approach is that it's multidisciplinary, that it's collaborative, it's analytically rigorous, um, it's principle-based, we want to be impact-focused, so it's actionable and practical solutions. And I just want to highlight that, um, you know, it's not always the case that something will involve the development of principles, but we take underlying core principles in our work, um, things like respect, um, for um, our partners and the different communities, um, in inclusion. Um, so there are some foundational principles that are always there at the core of every project that we work with. And so I'll quickly sort of run through, like design thinking, which some of our audience may be familiar with, um, ESC thinking has a particular process. And so we want to start with recognizing background imbalances of empower and inequities, background conditions of social injustice, which as we know, are prevalent in many of the communities for which the SDGs work for. We want to listen and amplify the voices of those that are most affected. And uh, as I mentioned, identify barriers and enablers, and then really try to understand what are the different values, interests, beliefs, and goals, and importantly, expectations. So sometimes when it's all lined up, nothing can derail a project or impact as failed expectations on the part of some partner or some stakeholder in the endeavor. And so this is really critical. And lastly, we want to then reconcile, find the common ground that can move the thing forward, and we rely on action guiding principles um, in order to do that. So that's a little bit about ESC thinking. And so what kind of issues do we address? Well, here's a, a small sampling. So we look at, for example, what ethical principles should guide data sharing in an international research consortium for multiomic studies addressing infectious disease. So you think of SDG 17, which is really around partnerships and data is a really important component. So data and the metrics and measuring all of this is really critical to moving this uh, work forward. But data sharing remains a remarkable challenge uh, in the global health space because of some historical inequities. And because historically you have um, a low resource settings where a lot of the data collection is sourced um, where it's gathered, it's a painstaking exercise, and then all of the analytic capabilities are in high income countries. And so you have this disparity between who gets to benefit um, from the value of the data. And so one of the things that we really try to do is to create that uh, level playing field and develop equitable sharing, data sharing approaches and equitable partnerships in order to move that forward. Um, another uh, sort of example, and I'll say a little bit more about this, um, is uh, what ethical issues are raised by the release of transgenic mosquitoes carrying a gene drive for malaria elimination. So as you can imagine, lots of um, complex issues there, um, particularly with regards to the elimination of species. What does that mean? Impact on the environment. How do host communities um, have a say in how uh, the research is developed and, and then implemented? 
what ethical principles should funders adopt to govern how human challenge studies are governed? And human, st human challenge studies are a controversial set of, of clinical research studies wherein healthy volunteers are subjected to um, uh, intentional infection with a pathogen under very carefully controlled conditions to assess the progression of disease and importantly, to assess how the intervention works in most cases a vaccine. And so early on in the pandemic, there was um, you know, a lot of interest in developing a human uh, COVID challenge study to fast track a, a COVID vaccine. And so we worked with the WHO to develop that ethical framework for how a human challenge study for COVID-19 uh, could be undertaken. Because of course, the, the critical piece there was that there was no treatment at the time for COVID-19. COVID-19. So there were important ethical questions around whether we should be intentionally infecting people um, with, with, with COVID-19, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, to expedite a vaccine in light of, of, the, of the tragedy that was unfolding with all of the infections and, and deaths that were mounting. And then lastly, um, we have this example which speaks to, uh, for example, the SDGs around uh, gender equality and really focused on empowering women and girls which is the introduction of one dose HPV vaccine in high burden and low and middle income countries that cannot afford the licensed two dose and three dose vaccines currently available on the market. So while high income countries have these, these licensed vaccines, uh, a current global shortage of supply of the HPV vaccine makes it very difficult uh, for it to be introduced into low resource settings where the burden of HPV infection is high and cervical cancer is high and particularly targeting that 15 to 25 year old um, uh, group of young girls and women. And so with the, with the shortage and with the difference between um, the, you know, having uh, what's licensed and what's available, there's this ethical question about whether we could justifiably introduce one dose if, if it's potentially creating an unequal uh, state of, of affairs between high income countries and low income countries. So just a quick reminder, we have 17 uh, sustainable development goals. And I'll be perfectly honest, when uh, Jessica um, invited me to, to give this talk and to speak a little bit about sustainable goal um, SDG 16, uh, I, I was really struck because most of our work, as you can see from the example of those questions, are really focused on good health and well-being. So managing infectious disease, addressing things like maternal health, um, HPV, um, and emerging technologies dealing with malaria. So it's really SDG three and quite a bit of work around uh, gender equality and SDG 10 reducing uh, inequalities as well. But SDG 16 is focused on peace, justice and strong institutions. And ordinarily when um, thinking about sustainable development goal 16, we think about you know, the resolution of conflict um, and thinking about uh, you know, peace and addressing some of those challenges, which I know many of my colleagues um, here on campus are doing. But um, it does speak to uh, promoting sustainable development in terms of providing access to justice for all and building effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. And so in fact, there are targets within sustainable development uh, goal 16 in which our work does tie into quite nicely. And I've just highlighted three of them here. So the first, uh, developing effective and accountable and transparent institutions at all levels. And an, and an important thing here to think about is what we mean by institutions. And so it's not always um, that institutions are brick and mortar, but we think about sort of the research enterprise or research as an institution. It involves a multiplicity of actors. It has a very defined pathway. It in, engages several stakeholders. So the institution of research, particularly research involving human subjects, is one where these elements of justice, accountability, and transparency are particularly important. And then the second point here, ensuring responsive, inclusive, and participatory representative decision-making at all levels. Well, this is certainly the case uh, within uh, that research enterprise. And one of the projects that I'm going to talk about shortly, which is the, um, the, the, the development and testing and introduction of gene drive mosquitoes for uh, malaria elimination certainly um, involves uh, important questions around the inclusion of communities 
and how we design uh, participation and representation in decision making, for example, in consenting to that. So a vector wide intervention like the release of a genetically modified mosquito goes into a community. But how do you define a community when mosquitoes potentially have the potential to spread beyond sort of the immediate release point? And so who gets to make those decisions? And how do they get to make those decisions? So these are certainly important questions which speak to some of the uh, projects that we're engaged in. And then broadening and strengthening the participation of developing countries and institutions of global governance. And this is something that we do both implicitly and explicitly through our partnerships, through um, our training programs, and through engagement in some of the work that we do with global actors like the World Health Organization policy development, where a critical piece is to ensure that governance, uh, particularly for these kinds of emerging technologies that are gonna be particularly salient in developing countries, that that type of voice and governance and power is there. And, and part of our work at IEPI is to bring uh, those questions and to bring attention to the need uh, to, to emphasize uh, governance um, from that perspective. So uh, thinking about the supporting and uh, supporting institutions at all levels in terms of accountability and transparency, I'm going to highlight a project uh, so that the gene drive work um, for malaria elimination is one that we've been engaged in um, from the very beginning, so for several years now, and working with uh, many of the actors uh, in this space. So um, in Africa with the African Union Development Agency, in the US with the funder, with the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, which is uh, quite involved in supporting uh, capacity development in terms of the um, um, in terms of the re regulatory piece. So our principles for gene drive research was really an endeavor that uh, we um, led with many of the funders supporting this type of work. And, and the critical thing to remember here is that this is a first in class technology. So gene drive is really genetic modification at the organism level where the genetic modification will persist and continue on in subsequent generations. And the intention there is actually that all the offspring actually inherit the genetic modification. So this is quite different from the traditional Mendelian inheritance where you have a 50% chance of getting something from your uh, from the father or from the mother. Here, the genetic modification pushes through, uh, the drive actually pushes it through. And so it goes into, and there's a, um, a you know, over 90% of, of the offspring inherit this uh, modification. And so as you can imagine, there's quite a bit of uncertainty still about uh, what that means in terms of risks to humans and the environment. So while the potential benefits are clear, so using something like this, to uh, target vector control diseases such as malaria. Um, we still don't know how uh, these gene drives might react and behave in the environment. And so there's quite a bit of uncertainty related to that. And then there are complex sociocultural and political issues, for example, related to um, something like the elimination of the mosquitoes. So one of the applications of gene drive is to suppress the population. So crash out, the, uh, the mosquito that transmits malaria and remove it um, from that environment locally. Now, for, uh, for many people that, uh, that obviously raises issues about the elimination of species. And while we're not uh, proposing to eliminate the mosquito species as itself, as there are over 3,500 species of mosquito and Anopheles gambiae is the one that's targeted in this research, it nevertheless has a lot of um, you know, important um, and complex ethical issues. And so the goal of the development of these principles was really to bring the funders of this research together and to make very explicit commitments around what the standards might be in a field which is so new in which standards are not there. And so researchers often are gatekeepers to how things are going to go. And so globally, there's now uh, 17 signatories uh, to these principles. Um, including the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, um, many, uh, the Medical Research Council of the UK, the South African uh, Research Council and, and uh, CHR, many, uh, Genome Canada, many, many governments um, have signed on to these principles and the commitments here 
have um, obviously financial implications. So commitments to sharing and being transparent about data, commitments to supporting and funding robust community engagement exercises so that communities have a greater voice um, and in, in the governance and, and in the say of how this research happens. Commitments to adhere to the highest uh, scientific standards and ethical integrity. And so this uh, uh, particular project has actually uh, taken on, um, uh, has served sort of as an exemplar for, for other uh, controversial research. And so there is now in, in many spaces, for example, in the human uh, challenge space, also the need to develop these, these types of principles. And so this is in one way in which the institution of research, for example, is being supported through trying to push through um, these, um, these types of uh, endeavors. Um, at the international level or at the global level, uh, we've done a lot of work with the World Health Organization in terms of, of policy making. And so last year, one of the things that we rapidly had to um, uh, support was the criteria for the ethical acceptability of COVID-19 uh, human challenge studies, as I mentioned. And of course, the challenge there is there is this important need for accountability and transparency, particularly since the world was in a state of panic. Uh, we were still learning about the virus. So uh, every day there was new information coming on the scene. So it was really important uh, to get this kind of global policy in place um, to move this type of work forward. And then um, we do a lot of work with other stakeholders. So for example, the Outreach Network for Gene Drive Research is an organization which um, is a global organization which is uh, meant to provide information, to clarify some of the misinformation and disinformation that's out there about gene drive. And so we've worked with many of the stakeholders in the space. And uh, several years ago, we partnered with the FNIH uh, to host a workshop to develop best practices on stakeholder engagement uh, for some of these area-wide vector control methods. And following um, on this work in the malaria space, uh, we worked also with the FNIH on this uh, document to map out uh, sort of the pathway to uh, getting gene drive mosquitoes from the lab uh, into, uh, uh, into, the, into the community. How, how would that pathway look like? How could you ethically introduce that kind of tool would it be if it was shown to be uh, effective and safe uh, as a biocontrol tool for the elimination of malaria. And of course, that work went on to inform um, the guidance framework for testing genetically modified mosquitoes, which was released in May of this year by the World Health Organization. And um, myself and uh, Travis Ramsey and Aaron Roberts, who is a doctoral student in our program, were involved in developing the chapter on ethics guidance for this framework. And this is right now the global guidance that we have, the overarching framework for the testing of these uh, mosquitoes for vector control. And it certainly applies in malaria, but also dengue and, and other types of vector-borne diseases. And so I'm just coming up here on the last slide and just want to emphasize then this piece around uh, partnering with our colleagues um, to help strengthen the role of LMICs in global governance. And the strengthening of, of uh, the role of low and middle income countries in global governance is really led by our partners in Africa and in, uh, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And so we really do play this uh, supportive role uh, based on our experiences. An example of this is our work with the African Union Development Agency, who lead um, the uh, work on emerging technologies. They have, they host the African Panel on Emerging Technologies, which is a high level panel that issues guidance on how um, emerging technologies can support the sustainable development in Africa. And they run these Colestis Joom executive dialogues for which we are um, uh, participants and contributors. And we bring the ESC thinking um, piece uh, to those dialogues, which engage uh, ministers of health, science and technology ministers and high level advisors on the continent to study things like gene drive technology, like drones, like smart technology for agriculture and, um, and climate change and next generation batteries and gene editing. So 
really a host of uh, really uh, exciting technologies to support sustainable development um, in achievement of the SDGs. And we're working with them to strengthen capacity also in ethics, because as I mentioned earlier, ethics really does play a critical role in supporting science, technology, and innovation. And you can't get those things um, into the communities without paying attention to those uh, ESC issues. And so we um, support uh, and co-host workshops to identify gaps and strengths in the human capital, tools and systems in the ethics space with the goal to uh, really support uh, ESC thinking in Africa. And um, we're also a host site for the Welcome Trusted Funded Global Forum on Bioethics Research Fellowship Program, which is a wonderful program designed to support early and mid-career scholars in uh, LMICs, low and middle income countries, to, uh, uh, to build ethics capacity and to really spend some time um, working on a bioethics project uh, with uh, host institutions. And so we are one of only two host institutions in Canada, um, the other being at the University of Toronto, some colleagues there. And um, we host annually uh, an African fellow who works on a project and was very pleased last week to welcome um, our fellow this year, Ruby, who is um, from Malawi, the College of Medicine, and who is doing uh, work on uh, malaria elimination and gene drive. And lastly, I just want to put in a quick shout out to my colleagues um, at the FNIH, um, who we are co-hosting with these Unsettled Ethics Issues in Gene Drive Research. It's a five-part webinar series, and it's really meant to engage the conversation on global governance of gene drive technology. And um, we are, we've run this five-part uh, series. We are actually have done four. We're coming up on the 5th on November 9th. And so really would like to extend an invitation to members of our audience. Um, if you're curious about gene drive technology, you wanna hear more about how it can be used for malaria elimination, uh, please feel free uh, to join us on the 9th. And so with that, I'm, I'm going to um, stop and uh, thank you uh, for listening. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to be part of this today. And I look forward uh, to, um, to answering uh, your questions and continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emerson. I found it very interesting how your work um, intersects and crosses over lots of the sustainable development goals that we're going to be um, talking about over the next little while through our Logger Lecture Series. So just a reminder, if you have questions for Dr. Emerson, please type them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And it looks like we have um, our first one says, what overall normative framework, if any, does the Institute use in ethical thinking component of its ESC approach? Okay, right. uh, thank you very much. It's a good question. So I would say, given our emphasis on uh, principles, action guiding principles, and really having sort of some core principles to uh, frame um, our work, I would say that it's more of a deontological approach. Um, and, um, and in part because, um, you know, and I'm a little bit hesitant to kind of uh, sort one out, but in terms of actually saying which one probably has the biggest influence, I would say it's a deontological approach. Myself, I, I think my Kantian leanings were probably uh, obvious during the presentation. I really do think um, that uh, the principle-based approach is one that has worked for us very well and um, has been um, you know, particularly useful in bringing out and emphasizing sort of those core norms of respect for individuals, respect for communities, and really, um, you know, emphasizing important things like uh, dignity and autonomy of individuals and communities and where we work. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question, innovation and technology seem to be increasing at a rapid pace in recent years. Are there any ethical challenges you foresee being at the forefront in upcoming years in terms of healthcare, sustainability, or the environment? And then they also said, thank you for the wonderful talk. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that, uh, so absolutely right. Um, certainly the pace of technology um, and, and science innovation is, is very rapid. 
And, and often in ethics, we say, right, the science outpaces the ethics, right? So things are happening so quickly that very often we're playing this kind of catch up where the reflection um, about the issues, you know, tends to happen after the fact. And so then we're kind of scrambling from frameworks. And this is why um, the work that we do, I think, is, is so interesting and uh, why I'm so excited by it and feel really privileged to be able to work with the many partners that we do is that we have the opportunity to be integrated right from the very beginning and to think about those issues as they're developing right along. Um, but thinking about um, the, the, the question itself, uh, the kinds of challenges that I foresee are some of the ones that we're seeing now. And that's going to be the understanding of the public and the communities around the technologies, what they mean. So their understanding and receptivity to this, right? So we see this now uh, vaccine hesitancy um, in, is you know, on the rise and certainly has been a challenge in, um, in many countries um, in, uh, in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and certainly were challenges before. Um, we were seeing measles outbreaks and, and other outbreaks of common childhood diseases that are you know, eliminated in, mar in many geographies, but seeing them pop up here and there um, because of a reluctance um, and concerns around vaccines. So vaccine hesitancy has been a challenge. Um, and then, you know, so I think that's going to be the, the, the most significant challenge is the understanding of what the technology is, how it impacts our life, and then receptivity. And then how can we harness and leverage it, particularly these technologies in the healthcare space, which can have the potential to do so much good. You know, how can we harness them for the public good while at the same time ensuring that um, we minimize the risks and at the same time ensuring that we're being inclusive and considerate of how certain communities um, have historically been left out um, you know, so uh, Black, Indigenous, um, and uh, communities of color have historically not been uh, participants in research. Um, they've been excluded. Uh, they've, they've suffered at the hands of, of many research enterprise exploitation. And so there's a lot of challenges there um, in ensuring that there's going to be um, acceptance, access, and inclusion. I think we have to think early on as we're developing these technologies to address uh, those concerns right from the beginning so that once things come to the market and they're ready um, for implementation, that we have the infrastructure and we have public confidence um, in order to use them. Great, thank you. Um, and we have one more here. Thank you for this informative talk. Could you talk more about the equitable data sharing agreements that you facilitate? Yes, thank you very much for that. So. Yes, yeah, so over the years, um, I can say that probably one of the most common challenges that we encounter um, in research is, um, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of, of data sharing, right? And so, and data sharing is, the challenge is not the same across all disciplines, certainly in public health. It's been a challenge because the culture of sharing in public health and epidemiology has not been there. So we often say that, for example, in genomics and genetics, it grew up um, in an open kind of open science environment. So right from the beginning, when we mapped the human genome, um, coming on, I guess, 20 years now, um, you know, the principles were made right from the start that this was not going to be owned by anyone and data was going to be shared. Uh, but the same is not true in other scientific disciplines. And so there's several things um, that we, we have to think about when we um, work on um, to try to achieve equitable data sharing. So in the first instance is to think about, um, you know, the, the benefit, the risks and benefits for the parties uh, to, to the data sharing agreements. And so very often in global health, what you have is partners um, in, in high income countries and low middle income countries. And as I've said, the sources of data, so the communities uh, that provide the data tend to be in low resource settings. And so that a lot of the collection happens there, but then a lot of analysis happens where there's capabilities, so these multi-omic labs and the large capabilities for modeling and using the data are in wealthier countries and, and in high income settings. And this, of course, creates this terrible disparity where then the benefits of what happens from the analysis of data, so publishing the results, um, are things that are important for, for career progression, um, for, um, for development and for moving forward. And inevitably it's scientists in high income countries who um, have historically benefited more from that. 
So in our work in trying to achieve um, equitable uh, data sharing, we try to focus on understanding one, what are the barriers and challenges? So sometimes they're technical challenges. The infrastructure may not be there. So we want to work with partners and with funders to ensure that the capacities, the technical capabilities, whether these are cloud solutions or analytic skills on a cloud solution or, or analytic tools, are there for scientists in low middle income countries to be able to access, download, and be able to use the data um, to uh, you know, make decisions, to drive their own uh, policy decisions and, and to be able to benefit from it. So that's the technical. On the normative side, um, the issues are often have to do with ownership, um, so who owns the data, so control and ownership of the data. So we ensure that ownership agreements, um, and, and you know, there's oftentimes um, not consensus uh, around um, a data ownership. And so there's very different perspectives on this. And so an example of this, in our tri-councils, in, in uh, the Social Science and Humanity Research Council and Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the NSERC, in our research councils, we have requirements and, and principles around data sharing, but it never actually states anywhere who owns the data. It's sort of taken for granted that you know, the data is held by the institution, by the investigator to do what, what they need to do. And this often conflicts with perceptions of data ownership in, in other settings. And so one of the things that we have to work through is to get past this notion of ownership. And we try to focus very much on principles of stewardship and kind of say the data is actually owned by the people and the communities who are generous enough to give it, to allow it, right? So, so and, and by data here, I'm talking not just about data that you collect on paper, but sometimes data in the form of um, human biospecimens. So blood, saliva, and the types of things that we collect in human clinical trials. And so to really try to think of data as really belonging to the individuals in the communities who are generous enough, generous enough to share it, and really think of institutions and investigators and others as stewards, as stewards of the data who have to really be protective of privacy, confidentiality, and to use it only for um, the manner that that it, it was set out. So that's one thing. We, we try to move away from ownership and towards st stewardship. The other thing is, is to be very specific around the benefits and really try to specify what, what would be beneficial for a low and middle income country partner or scientist to share data. Like what would motivate them to share data? If you address the concerns of ownership, and then you have to address concerns of then equity and, and benefits, and right. So often this means that, you know, the capability to analyze the data, ensuring that um, manuscripts, publications in credit for the research that comes out is jointly shared, um, that they drive uh, uh, the research. And so constructing agreements wherein we're paying attention to these things is, is actually really critical. And it seems um, you know, kind of like, isn't, isn't that obvious? Don't we do that already? No, we don't always do that. And we haven't historically done that. And so it, this is why there's always been uh, so much conflict. And part of this is one, the data sharing agreements, but the second part of it and the larger part and the one that we have less of a hand in um, is the culture change. So at the institutional level, um, at the, sort of the higher level, recognizing um, and giving credit to uh, data collection and analysis, not just publication. So when you think about um, what moves careers forward in research and academia, you know, it's publication, but we really have to start paying attention to things like data collection and analysis and what that means. And so it's really changing the culture and creating these systems and infrastructure that allows the participants in, in this data life cycle, if you will, um, to benefit um, equally um, from, from the engagement. That's great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question here. Um, so how does the harsh political world we live in today affect your work and the goals you are trying to achieve? Thank you, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, Yes, yeah, so it can be challenging um, in the sense, and I think this goes back to perhaps the, the point about uh, actors coming to the table with different values, interests, and beliefs. And so 
one of the things is in terms of, of, of that piece, this is where, again, trying to stay focused on the shared goal. So there are, of course, these background, these, these, these different challenges um, by the you know, different political context and what it might mean. And so an example of this, um, you know, several years ago, I guess coming on two years now, we were engaged in developing guidance uh, at the World Health Organization for the inclusion of pregnant women in clinical trials. And of course, um, you know, World Health Organization is a global document, and it's you know really stressing the importance of how you can ethically and safely include pregnant women in clinical trials. And yet, some of those uh, recommendations, um, you know, are very difficult to implement in places in Latin America, where, for example, access to contraception, access to termination of a dangerous pregnancy, for example, isn't always available. And so if you can imagine if you have a, a pregnant woman engaged in a clinical trial where something goes wrong and then she has no resources or support to turn to, it makes it very difficult. And so one of the things that we try, how that impacts our work is to then be much more sensitive to context and to recognize that even though uh, we can, you know, make the claim and say, well, universally, I think it should be the case that, you know, a woman uh, should have the supports that she needs, um, you know, to, to, to be able to go through a pregnancy and, and you know, and, to, um, and, and, and for maternal health that she needs. That's not always going to be the case in every place. And we have to be cognizant of that. And, um, and to really try to uh, then be considerate and cognizant of the kinds of then work that happens in those contexts. So there's not going to be a one size that fits all. And so it impacts our work to the extent that then ESC thinking is actually all the more relevant because an ethical analysis of, say, for example, that problem would only yield more than likely one solution, but taking the sociocultural considerations uh, into consideration then sort of yields a policy position or policy document that says, well, this needs to be implemented on a case by case or context by context basis. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon and a special thank you to Dr. Emerson for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to our alumni group. Follow today, you'll receive an email link to a survey. If you can kindly take a minute to fill it out, we'd appreciate the feedback. In about a week or so, we'll also share a link um, to those who registered for a recording of the talk, um, as well as we can share a link to the Institute of Ethics and Policy on Innovation website, as well as the master website on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So once, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Emerson, and enjoy the rest of your day.